those low fees are yeah, well, where's that? Where is that going to manifest itself? It's going to drive the price of the asset up, right? First of all, because the people that own the asset aren't losing one or two percent of their money every year. But second, because there are a lot of people that they will either invest a million dollars in it or nothing, right? So if I like it, I'll just invest a million. If I don't like it, I'll invest nothing. So you start to see money flowing from gold into Bitcoin, from real estate into Bitcoin, from the S&P index into Bitcoin. Michael Saylor, a famous billionaire business executive, has become one of the most well-known figures in the cryptocurrency industry. He is known for his extremely positive views on Bitcoin and his very insightful, interesting, and well-spoken monologues about the Bitcoin society, engineering, physics, and other complicated and interesting topics. Without a doubt, history is one of Sailor's favorite subjects, especially the history of Western civilization and how we got to where we are now. Sailor says in the interview that this has happened tens of thousands of times before and that the United States will definitely follow suit. This is one of the main reasons why Sailor is so optimistic about Bitcoin. It's the first asset that meets all of our needs for a truly desirable skerk. Surprise, they're successful. I expected them to be very successful. I think there's 10 years of pent up demand. Uh, they're the most eagerly anticipated development in Wall Street. This is like Bitcoin coming public. It's like the IPO of Bitcoin, except it's like 10 companies simultaneously taking Bitcoin public because Bitcoin's a commodity, it's not a security. So the idea that, uh, that BlackRock and Fidelity and Grayscale and Bitwise and ARK, they're all taking Bitcoin public at the same time is a big deal. Um, the fact that you know, I'm not surprised they're successful as ETFs because Bitcoin's the apex ETF. The other ETFs are based on oil, like let's say commodity ones, oil, gold, platinum, silver, palladium. <clears throat> market baskets of commodities, natural gas. All of these things are defective as investment assets because, com because physical commodities aren't scarce. Physical commodities can be manufactured in any amount with additional capital and know-how. So ultimately, um, the best of them is the gold ETF. But if, uh, if a bunch of money flows into a commodity ETF, that just actually fuels capital into commodity producers. They just dump that commodity on the market. The price gets held down. So commodity ETFs were never that great an idea. Um, on the other hand, comparing these, these Bitcoin ETFs to the S&P index, the biggest ETF and maybe the biggest development on Wall Street was the launch of the Spider SPY, in 1993, uh, about 30 years ago. And the idea that you could create an ETF that, that represented a market basket of 500 stocks that was big, and especially that was big because that came along at a point where people had lost faith in, in the currency as money, as a savings technology. And so they were trying to figure out what is money, and actually an entire generation of people picked the S&P index as money, right? How, how are you going to store your, your excess cash for a decade or longer? Not a checking account, not a savings account, not a bond. Uh, but the S and P, so the S and P became money, and that ETF became the monetary index, and that's why today, amongst you know that that's the most successful ETF. If you look at SPY and all the S and P index type ETFs, they have most of the capital in them. But um, the problem with those ETFs is that is that stocks also are not conservative. So if I increase the price of uh, the stock by a factor of 10, you're getting more equity. Or if uh, another way to say it is, if I take hundreds of billions of dollars of cash and I buy the ETF, like S&P ETF, the ETF has to buy all 500 stocks pro rata, which means they're going to have to go buy Tesla and Apple and Google and Meta at any price. They're price in insensitive, even if they're overpaying. So when they buy it at any price, what they're doing is they're creating more equity because they're encouraging those companies to issue more stock. And then, of course, uh, this is common sense. If the price of your stock doubles, the employees in the company with stock options, they sell the stock, right? They sell the stock option. When they sell the stock option, you put more stock on the market. So the price, uh, the price creates 
supply. There's a price supply uh, elasticity there. And that's the same as you have with commodities. It's the same as you have with REITs, real estate investment trust. And it's the same thing with bond funds. When you have capital flows into all those other asset classes, you create supply of that asset. They're not scarce. Saylor also talks about one of the most important questions people ask before investing in Bitcoin, is it too late to invest in Bitcoin in 2024? This is a common question that many potential investors have, which makes sense since Bitcoin has been around for over 15 years and many early investors have already made a lot of money. To answer this question, Saylor uses an interesting comparison between investing in Bitcoin and investing in stocks. People who bought in earlier probably thought those who bought later were very lucky. However, people have continued to invest in the city and make good returns on their money for hundreds of years since then. Saylor thinks the same thing will happen with Bitcoin. Some people bought when a coin was worth less than $100, others when it was worth $10,000, and millions of people will buy when a coin is worth $100,000 or even a million dollars. Bitcoin's unique because no amount of capital flowing into a Bitcoin ETF is going to create any more Bitcoin. You know, what we've got is 900 Bitcoin a day. And around April 16th to April 18th of this year, we're going to go to 450 Bitcoin a day. This will be the halving, but it will be the single most consequential halving in the history of Bitcoin because you're talking about, it's the equivalent of someone coming in the market saying, I'm going to buy eight and a half billion dollars of Bitcoin a year for the next four years, guaranteed. That's the demand impact, right? Eight and a half billion, $23 million a day at the current price. Now, that, that's a huge amount, but more importantly, that's a huge demand supply shift in the year when the demand via the ETFs has jumped by a factor of four to 10 times the daily supply. So what you have is institutional capital entering and then you have the supply getting cut in half. And, um, you know, what happened with these ETFs? Well, uh, here's what happened. The approval of the ETFs was, was a uh, pretty concrete endorsement of Bitcoin as an asset class by the regulators. And anybody who's thinking about banning Bitcoin or not approving Bitcoin ETFs, they're now out of consensus. So it really flipped the global consensus from, well, maybe it's too good to be true. Maybe it'll be banned. Maybe it won't be banned. Uh, the approval of those ETFs meant that it doesn't matter who wins the 24 elections. It's taken the future of Bitcoin out of the hands of the president. It's taken it out of the hands of the next head of the SEC. It's taken it out of the hands of of most regulators in the world, it's we pretty much open Pandora's box or cross the Rubicon. It's very concrete at this point. And it was uncertain, right, before. And so that's a, that's a very big uh, piece of regulatory clarity. What happened next is it, it's created a positive dynamic where now I think you're seeing pressure to approve ETFs in other places in Asia you'll probably see Hong Kong spot ETFs. You'll probably see them uh, come uh, get approved in any country where people are on the fence. It also created a fee war. It used to be that you paid two and a half percent, you know, to hold your money in grayscale. And all of a sudden now you're paying one and a half percent of grayscale, but you're paying 25 basis points at BlackRock, or you're paying 20 basis points and even 19 basis points. Not only that bring down fees for institutional holders of Bitcoin in the U.S., it also put pressure on international fees. So you uh, actually saw a rippling effect and people with uh, European or Canadian or, or other uh, spot ETFs in the rest of the world that had 100 basis point fees or 150 basis point fees, they're having to bring down their fees because otherwise the capital will flow out of their instrument into the lower cost instruments. So yeah, let me, let me convert the math here. If you have an infinite duration asset and you're going to put, uh, if you're going to put money in it, then the difference between, um, 2% fees 
and uh, 25 basis point fee is losing 37% of your money. You understand? Like, like it's like I take a third of your money, okay? So if you're a Bitcoin investor, you know, having low fees means you invest a million and you get to keep the million. Having high fees mean you invest a million and you lose 300,000 of it over the course of 20 years. So those low fees are, well, where is that, where is that going to manifest itself? It's going to drive the price of the asset up, right? First of all, because the people that own the asset aren't losing one or 2% of their money every year. But second, because there are a lot of people that they will either invest a million dollars in it or nothing, right? So if I like it, I'll just invest a million. If I don't like it, I'll invest nothing. So you start to see money flowing from gold into Bitcoin, from real estate into Bitcoin, from the S&P index into Bitcoin. And so that's a big deal. So so the, the launch of the ETFs, it's been very successful. This is the ideal type of asset to put into an ETF wrapper. It's definitely the mo it's the global asset. It's the biggest brand. Everybody knows what it is. It's actually the best thermodynamically sound investment. It's got the best historic performance. And of course, it doesn't have the entire array of uh, risk factors that a company has or that a bond has. It doesn't have credit risk. It doesn't have corporate execution risk, you know, and it, and it doesn't have uh, currency devaluation risk. During interviews, Saylor lists counterparty risks for all financial assets. Large amounts of gold are difficult to move. Company stocks depend on the CEO's drive, work ethic, and experience. What will happen 10 or 20 years from now when someone else rules? Would you trust them with your money? Even though it only measures the world's top 500 companies, Saylor claims the S&P index fails to create shareholder value by 99%. He also wonders about the other hundreds of millions of enterprises worldwide. Despite being the world's reserve currency, the dollar has lost nearly 9-8% of its value in 100 years. List of what happens when countries are weaker continues. Bitcoin is the only asset resistant to these hazards and will remain scarce and desired for centuries. Share your thoughts on Michael Saylor's insightful Bitcoin analogy and long-term projections for the most valuable digital asset. Post your comments below. Like this video, subscribe to the channel, and enable post alerts for additional videos. Thanks for watching.